so the topic for this lecture is going to be evaluating generative models. Okay, so uh, as usual, quick recap of what we've seen so far. So this is our figure that's summarizing the problem that we've been trying to solve for most of the class. And I would say that you can view the, uh, the, the, the contents of the class in, in different ways so far. We've seen several generative modeling families, and we've also seen several generative modeling tasks. And we saw that certain modeling families are better suited for certain tasks than others, right? So the most obvious task is probably generation, which means that we want to generate high quality samples. We want to generate these kinds of images. So based on data, we want to generate images which might look like this. Uh, given a data set of dog images, we want to generate new dog images. And we saw many types of generative models that can solve this task reasonably well. Uh, but that's not the only task that we might be interested in. Another task that we also saw in the first set of lectures was density estimation. Uh, and outlier detection can be a special application of density estimation. Um, so in density estimation, we actually want to learn this data probability. We want to minimize some notion of similarity between the data probability and the model probability. We want to have a model which actually looks like our data distribution, and then we can accurately estimate the probability of, uh, we, can, we want to be able to accurately estimate the data probability on new data. And again, certain models are better than others for this task. So our regressive models are models where we can really easily compute the likelihood. So they're very well suited for density estimation. Uh, similarly to normalizing flows, and I also added energy-based models because we saw that once we have trained the model, we can perform outlier detection without using normalizing constant. But some models are not great for that. For example, GANs, they can only generate samples they're not great at density estimation. And then the other task that we saw, which is also really important, is representation learning. Uh, we don't wanna just generate or fit the probability. We also want to discover some new interesting facts about the, the, the data. We wanna discover stru interesting structure in the data. And that's something that we might be able to do using uh, certain types of models. In particular, latent variable models are best suited for this. So these are three tasks and different models for these tasks that we have seen. So in this lecture and in the next few lectures, I'm not going to introduce any new models. We're gonna keep working with these models, but we're gonna try to understand which models to use when, as well as how to combine them and look at different mm, special cases of these models where there's some interesting complications. For example, discreteness would be one. Um, so mostly we're going to look at how to work with these models. And in order to decide how to work with these models and in order to decide how to apply which model in which scenario, it's important to understand how can we evaluate models, right? So in order to decide which model to use when, we want to be able to evaluate these models and have some principled way of determining when a model is good and when a model is not good. Okay, so that's the... That's the task that we're going to be, uh, that's the focus, that will be the focus of this lecture. So we will look at, we will specifically look at evaluation and, and, and how to perform evaluation for general model, general models. Now, as you can imagine, and I think I alluded to this in one of the earlier, one of the first lectures of the class, evaluating general models is actually quite hard. It's much harder to evaluate a generative model than a discriminative model. And the main reason for this is that generative model can do many more things that a discriminative model cannot do. The only goal of a discriminative model is just to maximize your accuracy. So you have a natural metric. Here, the, the question of how good is the generative model depends on the question of what task do we care about, All right? And I, I just named three very common standard tasks that exist in generative modeling. So density estimation, generation, representation learning, even these three tasks are very different from each other. And as I showed you on the earlier slide, certain models are better for certain tasks. Um, so not every model is well suited to every task. 
Um, but it's even more complex. It's even more interesting. It's even more complex. Uh, there's other tasks that we could be using with uh, that we could be applying generative models to. Um, for example, semi-supervised learning could be a task. Uh, maybe we're interested in uh, in a predictive task like supervised learning or semi-supervised learning. So in this case, we would probably care about some kind of supervised metric, I guess. Uh, we could also care about a supervised learning task, but where the prediction is very high dimensional, like image to image translation. You can also be interested in compression or, or compressive sensing. Um, my point is that there's many, many other applications besides the three that I that I just named that we could be interested in. And, uh, and because a model can do so many tasks, it's rare that a single model will do, will be the best at every task. And so in order to evaluate the model, we need to at least focus on a subset of these tasks. Um, so how do we do this? So for this lecture, I want to look at a subset of these tasks. In particular, we're going to look at the three main tasks that I outlined earlier on the very first slide, which is density estimation, uh, generation, or evaluating sample quality, and then latent variable modeling. And for each of these, tasks, I will look at some standard methods for evaluating general models and trying to determine whether they're good or not. So that's the plan. Um, any questions so far? Okay. All right. If not, then let's start with density estimation. So if you remember, density estimation is the goal of learning some model P theta that is a good approximation to the data distribution. So in some sense, this is the most general task that we could be solving. We literally want to discover the true data distribution. And if we can actually solve this task, if we can recover the data distribution, then in some sense, we can solve all kinds of downstream tasks in an optimal way. So for example, um, if we have the, if P is a perfect model for the data distribution, then we can clearly, and if we happen to be able to sample from P, then we can perform perfect sampling, clearly. Uh, and we can also, even with an imperfect model, we can solve certain useful tasks, such as outlier detection. Um, so maybe a more, uh, a more specific formulation for what it means to density estimation is to approximate the, model uh, the data distribution with the model distribution using some kind of metric. And so that's what we did when we talked about log likelihood. We defined the scale divergence as our metric, and we defined the task of density estimation as minimizing scale divergence. Um, and then we saw that when we minimize the scale divergence, we are equivalently maximizing likelihood. So one way in which we can define the density estima estimation task more precisely is minimizing scale divergence. Right, so density estimation is this general idea, you know, fit the model distribution to the data distribution. That's kind of, that's a little bit hand wavy. What does it exactly mean? One way to exactly define density estimation is that I want to make the KL divergence small between the model distribution and the data distribution. And there's different, there's also different objectives, but we'll stick with the KL divergence for now. That's how I'm going to define this for the purpose of the next few slides. Um, and then we saw that maximizing, uh, minimizing the scale divergence is equivalent to maximizing log likelihood. So we can say that we have, we can say that we're doing well at density estimation if we can have a low scale divergence or equivalently a high likelihood on held out data. So if we have held out data and our likelihood on the data is large, then it means that we have a good approximation. We have our, our distribution is in some sense close to the data distribution. And if we have two models and one of them has a higher likelihood on, on new data, then because the maximum, because the likelihood is the kill divergence plus a constant, it means that that model with the higher likelihood, it also has a lower kill divergence relative to the data distribution. So in other words, we can quantify how good we're how good we are at density estimation by using the maximum likelihood as a metric. 
high maximum likelihood means we're doing better at density estimation. So literally, density estimation reduces to maximum, like, or one way to quantify, one way to define a rigorous principle metric for density estimation is to use maximum likelihood, again, because that is KL divergence plus a constant, and KL divergence is a notion of similarity between the data and the model distribution. So that's how we're going to define this, um, right? And now that we have this metric, well, we can try to compute this metric in various types of models. And we have seen several models, in particular, of a regressive flow, uh, of regressive models and normalizing flows that have tractable log likelihoods, which means that we can evaluate this metric easily and directly, right? So how do we do this? We literally just split our data set into a training, a validation, and a test set. Then we fit the model on the train set. Then we tune the hyperparameters on the validation set by, again, using the log likelihood as our guiding metric for hyperparameter tuning. And then we evaluate the likelihood on the test set. And that is literally, it's, it's almost like reporting the KL divergence modulo the constant and modulo some approximations uh, that are attributed to Monte Carlo approximations. But to a good extent, we are approximate, approximating the KL divergence by measuring the log likelihood. So if the log likelihood is computable, then we can just use that as our metric. And in at least those kinds of models, we have a good estimate for, uh, we have a principled metric, a principled evaluation approach for determining if we're good at density estimation. So that's easy. In certain models, that's easy. Um, however, not every models, not every model has a tractable log like. So we saw at least three, four even models, also diffusion, well, I guess diffusion, diffusion also and score-based models. Uh, in fact, most of the models that we have seen in the class don't have a tractable likelihood. Uh, in the case of a VE, we have, uh, we have to use the elbow, right? So for, for VE, we don't have the actual log likelihood. We can only approximate the log likelihood. We only have the elbow. Um, so that makes things more difficult. Um, and then with GANs, we only have samples. Uh, with score-based models, we also have only samples. Although if we if we have the if we take the diffusion perspective, then we also have an elbow. Uh, for energy-based models, we do have the log. We, we can theoretically compute the true log likelihood, but it requires computing the partition function, which is intractable. So, for in, in, for most intents and purposes, it's also intractable to compute in energy-based models. And so, in that case, we have to do something more complicated. So, in the case of VEs, it is common to use the elbow as a substitute for the log likelihood. If you read generative modeling papers, you will often see that in the same table, they compare both log likelihoods and elbows on log likelihoods. And in practice, at least for image data sets, this often uh, still works. The elbow turns out to be uh, quite competitive with the state of with, with main state of the art log likelihoods, and so in practice, it's okay to just report the log likely the the elbow and specify either mark it as a little star or you or uh, often in papers they report that the log likelihood is greater than or equal to this number, so it's just literally reported as a lower bound. Um, so it's still possible to use the uh, the elbow, and I'll, I'll I'll mention in a moment a better way of doing this, but. <laughs> At least reporting the elbow is possible. Uh, well, actually, the better way, or another way, which is also good, but sometimes the elbow is actually quite decent, and and we don't even use this other approach. But uh, in cases where the elbow is not tight, then we can perform special types of sampling to get an estimate of the log likelihood using a V type of model, and this involves a technique called uh, important sampling. Or for energy-based models, there's an even uh, there's a more sophisticated technique called anneal importance sampling, which which can get better samples of the log likelihood. So we can we can still estimate for VEs and energy-based models the density, the, the log probability directly. Um, and in other 
models, in particular in implicit models such as GANs, which can only generate samples, and maybe you have some kind of score-based model that you know you don't want to compute the elbow and you just want to use the samples. In that case, there are still some techniques that could be used. Uh, theoretically, it is possible to use versions of non-parametric kernel density estimation to try to estimate the density from samples. Uh, and that's something that I will talk about as well in GANs. Um, so there are techniques to use when the log likelihood is not tractable, but I should also add that these techniques are not bulletproof. So sometimes, like if you train a VE on MNIST or, or even more complicated data sets, the elbow can sometimes can often be very tight. And so the elbow can be a good solution. But in other cases, for example, annealed importance sampling with an energy-based model, that sometimes works, but it's much more difficult to get working well. And for certain very complicated energy-based models, it won't give you results that are as good. Uh, and then also for GANs, non-parametric kernel density estimation can work in theory, but if you have very high dimensional samples and you don't have enough of them, it will still not work as well. So these methods can work, but they don't always work. Um, there's some nuances to keep in mind. Okay, so what are some of these techniques? First of all, remember I said that if you don't want to report the elbow, you can try to report the actual log likelihood from a VE-based model by applying a technique called important sampling. So you can think of important sampling as a clever way of applying Monte Carlo sampling. Uh, so the math behind this is going to fits on one line. Remember that our goal is to estimate this log likelihood, uh, well, this probability P of X, the probability under the model. We can rewrite this probability as this, um, as, as this sum. Uh, so this is just applying the law of total probability, but in practice, this sum is intractable. What we can do is something clever. So here, let, let's say I'm just gonna multiply and divide by some distribution Q. This is kind of what we did when we derived the elbow. Remember, I just introduced an arbitrary distribution Q. Here, I again, introduce some distribution Q. This will work for any Q, uh, and I'll tell you in a moment which Q is better, but for now, this works for any Q. I just multiply and divide, and now observe that this looks a lot like an expected value where I'm taking the expectation with respect to this distribution Q of Z. But the integrand is not the original joint probability. It's this joint probability that's been adjusted by a factor Q of Z for each Z. And this Q of Z, we, or one over Q of Z, we refer to that as the importance weight. Um, and so this is important sampling because we're Sampling Z, not, I guess if we were to apply Monte Carlo to this, we would have to sample Z uniformly, essentially, uh, right? This is just each Z here, we're just summing over all the Z's and each Z has the same weight here. So we're just sampling Z uniformly, that's not great. Uh, here, we're sampling Z using another distribution Q, which can be any distribution. And if Q is chosen well, then, this expression, when approximated using Monte Carlo, it will not only have the correct expected value, because that's true for any distribution, even for the uniform, even when Q is uniform, it still correctly has the right expected value. But with clever Q, we will have a lower variance uh, estimator. So the, the Monte Carlo estimator will have a lower variance. And so we're going to be able to get P of X more accurately. Um, yeah, so Q can be any distribution, but the ideal distribution is one that has low variance. And if you work out the math, if you choose, so if you choose, I guess, Q star, which is the ideal Q, uh, the ideal Q star is actually the true posterior P of Z given X. So that's the optimal Q. And if you were to actually plug in this Q inside this formula, you will see that this will always reduced to P of X for any, for any, um, for, for any, so even for one sample, you will have exactly the correct answer. So this will have a variance of literally zero and the correct expected value. This is the optimal solution, but in practice, you can't get this, but you might get a good approximation. Um, yeah, and this is kind of what the elbow does. It also essentially tries to, you can think of the elbow as a, as, a, as, close, as being closely related to important sampling. 
So this works for any distribution. And now after you have trained a VAE, you could use, so because the VAE encoder approximates this, uh, this true posterior, you can use the VE encoder as part of this formula to get, to get what, what you want. So this is important sampling, right? Um, yeah, so specifically, this is the full process, right? If we wanted to get an estimate of this probability, we sample these latent variables from Q of Z, and then we approximate this expectation using Monte Carlo, which is just which is just this formula. So that's the full definition of important sampling. And again, if you have a VE, you can use the encoder. So Q phi of Z of X, which approximates P of Z given X, is a good encoder to use here. It is sorry. This encoder is a good choice for the uh, distribution. Yeah, so again, this, this gives you a correct density. Uh, in practice, we choose, yeah, we choose that. Um, so this is just what I told you uh, in slides. And uh, I'm not gonna derive this in detail, but you can also look up at this technique called annealed important sampling. Annealed important sampling, which is uh, an extension that also works for energy-based models. And there, the Q is essentially annealed between, um, well, actually, no, sorry. You use important sampling, but you anneal P. So initially, you use important sampling to sample from a noise distribution, and then you gradually anneal that distribution from being noise to being the true distribution, and you reuse those samples over time. Uh, well, yeah, essentially, yeah. In annealed important sampling, you start from an energy-based model whose temperature has been made so large that it's almost uniform, and then you gradually reduce its temperature and you keep sampling like this. Okay, it's almost like a diffusion model. Yeah, you kind of, you start with a completely diffuse Q and then you gradually make it more and more and more precise. Um, and you reuse the sample from the previous step. Yeah, so you can think of it as actually sampling from a score-based or a diffusion model. It has a lot of the same structure. I'm not gonna define what it is, but you should be aware of a new important sampling as a technique that you can use for more complicated distribution when Q of, Q of Z doesn't work, right? Like if P is an energy-based model and finding good Q, a good Q is really hard, then you could switch to something more sophisticated, which is a yield important sampling, which is going to, instead of sampling from a fixed P, it will try to also anneal P uh, and, and it still fits in this important sampling framework. Okay, so this is important sampling. And important sampling works in any setting where you can get an unnormalized probability, right? So here we wanna sample P of X, we have access to the joint P of X given Z, um, but we don't have access to P of X itself. We have access to the joint. So you can think of the joint as being kind of an unnormalized version of the marginal where the normalization factor is, uh, what would it be? Uh, well, you can view the, eh, yeah, essentially something like that. Uh, you, can, you, can, you can view the joint as being an unnormalized version of distribution or in an energy model, you also have an unnormalized distribution. But what if you don't even have an unnormalized distribution? What if, you're, what if you have a GAN and the GAN only generates samples and you don't even have access to the joint or you don't even have, you don't even have access to the energy of an energy-based model? What do you do then? What if you only have samples? So in this case, we can resort, as I said, we can potentially try to resort to a technique called kernel density estimation. So what's the idea of kernel density estimation? Let's say that we have a model, but we only have samples from the model. And just to illustrate what kernel density estimation is, let's say that we have six data points. So these are, these are, are six data points. They're all one dimensional. So these are the values that they take. And let's say that we wanna estimate the probability from these six data points. Let's say we wanted to estimate a density from these samples. How would we do this? Well, let's say specifically we wanted to compute after once we have the, these samples, we wanted to compute or, or estimate the density 
of a point that's not present in our in our data set. Let's say it's 0 0.5 minus 0 0.5. So what would be its density? Well, one answer that could be made here is that, well, it's not in our set of samples, so then it's zero, right? But that doesn't feel right. It's probably unlikely that it's zero because we only have, we only have six samples in our, in our model. Another approach would be to then maybe try to have a histogram. So we could try to bin the samples, right? So these numbers, they're all somewhere between, I guess, 6.2 and minus uh, 2.1. So this, this range kind of corresponds to our range here at the bottom. Uh, and then we can form bins of a certain size and we just count how many points fall in each bin. So here in, mo in most bins, in these, in these bins, I have one data point, then I have one large bin with two data points, and I have one bin with nothing. Um, so this is just a histogram. We know what a histogram is. Uh, so the histogram already gives a better approximation of what the density looks like, right? It seems like we have a little bit more here and then a little bit less here. It kind of looks like a distribution that has this shape. So that's good. Um, but imagine if we try to slightly play around with certain points. For example, okay, so these are the parameters of the histogram. Let's say that we again wanted to compute 0 0.5. Now we get something that's 1 sixth, one, 1 over 6, because minus 0 0.5 falls into which bin? I think it falls into, I think it has to fall into, oops, it has to fall into this bin, so it's 0 0.5. Um, now, what if I look at another thing called, uh, another variable, minus, minus two? Um, so it falls, well, so minus 1.99, it also kind of falls in this bin, but it falls at the very edge of this bin. And if I just perturb minus 1.99 by a little bit, now it falls into, no, sorry. Okay, sorry, sorry, I said this wrong. One over six is the big is the big bin, and one over twelve is the small bin. <laughs> okay, um, so before, yeah, both minus zero point five and minus two they fall in a big bin, but now this, uh, so this number, if I just if I just perturb minus one point nine nine and I make it minus two point zero one, now it falls into the small bin. So if I just shift a little bit, my probability changes by a lot. This is non smooth, and so. It, from that sense, it's a little bit unsatisfying. So what kernel density does is to try to smooth this histogram using kernels. It does the thing that I drew with my pencil just a moment ago on the slide where I tried to have it look like two Gaussians. So in particular, in kernel density estimation, our estimate of the probability looks like essentially a weighted average so the probability of a new x here, x is a new number, it looks like a weighted average over all of the data points, but each data point, it gets a weight that is specified by a kernel k, and this kernel k, it is, its magnitude is proportional to how close x is to the ith point, okay? Uh, and then sigma here is a hyperparameter called the band help. Let me give you an example. So, one example could be the Gaussian kernel. Again, it's something, it's a number that you want to be large when xi and x are similar. Therefore, xi contributes more weight and you want it to be small otherwise. So this, so this function, it satisfies this property. When x and xi are far apart, this is almost zero. And when they're close to each other, this is almost one. Uh, no, it's not one, but it, it's, a, it's a large number. Okay, and so what happens in practice is that instead of having this discretized histogram, we have something which looks smoother. We have something which looks like this, right? Which is just this. So we have a smooth version. And the reason it's smooth is that this is a weighted average of many kernels. So here, this, oops, uh, whatever. Uh, here, these, dashed, these dashed lines, they represent little kernels. And so you can think of that big curve 
as being the sum of many of these small kernels. So in some areas, like here, when you have a lot of these kernels, then it looks, uh, then the peak is higher, and in areas where there's fewer points, there's less kernels. Um, okay, so, and again, ju just another way of looking at this formula is that here, given a new X, I am counting how many XIs are close to it. So I count, I sum over all the XIs and the contribution of each XI to the sum, it is adjusted by this kernel. And so this kernel is large when Xi is close to X. So if X falls in a portion of the input space, like here, where there are a lot of points, then there will be in the sum several points with a large kernel value. Therefore, the, the sum will be larger. And if it falls in a region of the space like here, where there are no points at all, well, this kernel will be almost zero for every xi, therefore p of x will be also zero. Okay, so essentially kernel density estimation is a way to try to guess density only from samples. Uh, the main, so here are some, well, okay, first of all, how do you choose the kernel k? Remember that there's this bandwidth parameter and the bandwidth parameter matters, it can result in choosing the right bandwidth is important for having a kernel estimate that's not too smooth or that's not too sharp, um, right? So for example, okay, the kernel, that's just the definition of a kernel. Um, it's a measure of similarity and essentially the bandwidth control controls smoothness. So controls smoothness. What I mean by this, here I have an example, maybe you can just zoom in like this. Here I have an example with um, with many points falling. So, so here I have quite quite a few more points here, and this is the result of doing kernel density estimation with different kernels. If you use a kernel that's too smooth, you get a big curve like this, but this seems to be way too overstretched. If you use something that's too sharp, uh, that's the, if, you, if the bandwidth is too small then you're essentially overfitting because you're fitting these like small uh, noise, you're fitting the small noise in your data. So what you really want is something which kind of looks like this and that's what the correct kernel size will, will give you. Okay, so the bandwidth controls the smoothness and uh, yeah, so this is what I just showed on the previous figure. You can tune it via cross-validation. And if you tune the bandwidth well, this can be an estimate of density. Now, the main limitation of kernel density estimation is that it doesn't work that great in high dimensions. If you have a very high dimensional data, then you need a very large number of samples. So this is an approach that can work in theory. If you only have samples, you could try to do this. But, uh, and this is, oh, by the way, this is guaranteed to, given enough samples, this is guaranteed to give you the true density. So there is, if you, yeah, there, there is like a mathematical analysis, kernel density estimation is guaranteed to recover the true density given enough data. The problem is that that rate is exponential in the dimensionality. So in practice, this doesn't work great for, there are definitely worst case scenarios where this will not work well. And even in practice, it will probably not work well for very high dimensional data, but theoretically for evaluating sample-based or implicit-based gener implicit generative models in low dimensions, this could be a potential principled approach, but in high dimensions, this caveat is really important. Yeah. Um, so if you're using cross-validation to figure out the bandwidth, what exactly are you comparing? Oh, you would have held out data and you would try you would estimate the likelihood on held out data. Okay. So if you're like, if you're really, in the extreme case, if you're overfitting and you have a delta function at each data point, then given a new, a new data point, you'll have very low probability. Oh, you're just showing that it has high. Okay, Never yeah, mind. that makes sense. Yeah, but it's also the same principle as why we would use hyperparameter, why we would use held out log likelihood as a hyperparameter selection metric for a regular general model. The same principle holds. 
Mm -hmm. Cool. So essentially, this is kind of kernel density estimation, and this and these are. So I guess these are the main techniques that I have, you know, that I have for you in terms of how we can compute density. And next, I want to look at a few other tasks: sample quality and latent variable quality. Uh, before I do this, are there any more questions on kernel density estimation? Oh, or sorry, not kernel density estimation, but density estimation in general. Okay, so if not, then let's look next at sample quality. So we talked about density estimation. And as I said earlier, density estimation is in theory, the most general task we could have in machine learning because it's literally estimating the, the data distribution. If we can perfectly estimate the data distribution, if we drive our KL diversions to zero, then we have perfectly recovered the data distribution. And then we will have, by definition, have perfect quality because we're literally sampling from the data distribution. In practice, however, we're not going to be able to perfectly optimize the log likelihood. And when our model is imperfect, having improvements in log likelihood doesn't always correlate perfectly with sample quality. So you could have a slightly better model in terms of KL diversions, but it could have also slightly worse samples. So sample quality and log likelihood are not perfectly correlated. This is what we saw when we looked at GANs and we had this example, we had these two examples. The first one is an example where we have potentially really good test log likelihoods, but poor samples, right? Let's say that we have this mixture distribution. Let's say that we define our model to be a mixture distribution that's 100% data. And let's say we somehow knew the data distribution and it's 90% noise. So clearly this will have bad samples because it's 90% noise. Um, but we can also argue that it will have quite decent log likelihood. For example, uh, we can form, we can use the definition of P to get an upper and lower bound on its log likelihood. So first of all, this is just the definition of the log likelihood. And because the log is, is, uh, is a monotone function, then we get that the log probability, this, this density, is going to be within this constant factor of the true data distribution. So the log probability of the model will be within a log factor of the data, uh, within a constant factor of the log likelihood of the data, <clears throat> right? So here we have a lower bound and we also have an upper bound because we know that the optimal log likelihood will always be achieved by the data distribution because it achieves the lowest possible KL divergence. So we also have an upper bound. This is our upper bound. This is our lower bound. So we know that the true, we know that our model distribution, sorry, we know that our model log likelihood is going to be sandwiched between the true data distribution and this additive constant. Okay. But this constant is additive when this data X is very high dimensional, then P of X becomes in practice, very small, uh, which means that log p of x becomes a very large negative number. And so the magnitude of log p of x becomes very large. So for high dimensional x, log p of x will be very large in absolute value. It will be a very, it will, it will go towards zero, uh, uh, sorry, towards minus infinity. And when it goes to minus infinity, but so, so yeah, this can go to minus infinity, Oh, sorry, this can go to minus infinity. The fix this. This goes to minus infinity, but this is a constant. So the log data, so the log probability of the model will be on relative terms almost the same as the true log likelihood. It will only be this constant, but as a percentage, it will be almost the same. Right? So again, this increases log 100 remains constant. So this will, as a percentage of the data distribution, our log distribution will be going to 100%. And so in this case, especially for very high dimensional model, it will be really hard to disentangle good samples using, uh, to, disentang to separate models which have good samples and bad samples using only the log likelihood. So this is an example of how we can get good log likelihood but poor samples. Conversely, we can have good samples, 
but really poor test likelihoods. So for example, you could memorize the training set. Clearly, this presents very visually appealing samples, but, but the test set has zero probability because we never sample anything close to it. Our true, well, our chosen model distribution is literally a delta function over the training set. So the test set has zero probability. And so, and this is, these are two examples of why using the log likelihood as our metric doesn't necessarily mean that we're gonna be doing well on other tasks, such as on generation. And this was also our motivation for developing GANs, which have a different objective that's not the log likelihood. Um, and similarly for evaluating model, if what we're really interested in sample quality, it doesn't make sense, well, reporting log likelihood will not correlate necessarily with sample quality. Um, so how can we do this then? We can try to come up with metrics that look at samples directly. Instead of using the log likelihood as a proxy for sample quality, we could try to create, create metrics which assess samples directly. One way to do this would be human evaluation. And that's something that is sometimes done in some works. Now, the problem is that this is expensive and you have to hire a lot of humans and it takes a lot of time. Um, this is not a very scalable solution. Um, in particular, it's hard even for humans to assess certain metrics like generalization. For example, there's this ongoing question with many general models, in particular GANs and even diffusion models, when they generate a good sample, is that because there is a very similar sample, for example, a very similar human face that's found somewhere along, somewhere in the training set and the model has just memorized this data set. This is really hard to evaluate and it's even hard to evaluate using mechanical Turk because no human will ever be able to systematically go through the training set and find that. Uh, so it doesn't capture certain problems like generalization. Um, and also, if you, if, you, if you ask them to rate images, this meaning can have, this, this rating can have different meanings for different humans. So it's not a particularly robust and reliable approach. I mean, it is one approach, but it's definitely not bulletproof. Um, and so people have also come up with quantitative metrics that are they don't require human intervention to evaluate sample quality directly. And these include inception scores, FID, and KID, which I will describe next. Um, so these are quantitative metrics, which unlike mechanical Turk, don't require you to ask a human for readings. So they're completely um, automated. So first, we'll look at inception scores. What is an inception score? An inception score is a technique which uses a, a classifier to assess sample quality. So let's say that you're generating human faces or, or, or even MNIST digits. Or let's say you're generating CIFAR-10 images. CIFAR-10 has 10 classes. If you have generated good images, then <clears throat> a classifier trained on CIFAR-10 should also do well on your data set, on the generated samples. So this is the intuition here. In particular, it's using this uh, neural network architecture called Inception from Google, which is this large pre-trained uh, convnet for image recognition. It's using that classifier as an as an auxiliary model to perform evaluation of generated samples. Um, but actually, even though it's called an Inception score, this is theoretically defined for any classifier. So the more general condition for applying an Inception score is that we have a label data set. Oops. We have a label data set. And we also have access to some classification model uh, that predicts the probability of Y given X for any input X, right? And so often this is an inception neural network trained by Google. Um, this is where the inception that this is often this is the, or originally this, when this model was proposed, they used the inception architecture from Google, which is where the name comes from, but it can also be any classifier. And so uh, inception scores define a metric that tries to look at two criteria, sharpness and diversity. So sharpness, this is the formula 
And this can be thought of as being the entropy, the conditional entropy of C of Y given X, right? So this is literally the expected entropy of the variable Y. And why do we want to have a high entropy? Well, we want the model to be confident in its predictions uh, when it's giving, when, when you give it a new class, uh, when you give it a new object, you want it to be confident on what the class is. So we're asking the generative model to produce Xs that are easy to classify by the classification model that's been trained on the real data, right? So if this score is high, it means that the, con the classifier is confident when making predictions on generated images. Um, so that's good. Um, yeah, and so this is equivalent to saying that the predicted distribution has a uh, low entropy. The other thing that we want also is diversity. So we don't want to just output the same number many times, we want to have a diversity of numbers. And so there's a different formula that tries to quantify this, uh, again, using the uh, using this classifier, and it's really similar to the previous one, but here, here we now have the marginal instead of the conditional distribution. And if you combine these two things together, yeah, so we want to have high entropy over C of Y, we want to generate many images, so we want the marginal to have high entropy. Um, and then the KL divergence is, oh, sorry, the inception score is a metric that combines these two scores into a single simple metric. Uh, and so in practice, people evaluate this inception score and report this in papers uh, using some pre-trained neural net. Um, and this can be shown to correlate reasonably closely to visual sample quality. And in the original paper, they argued that this is better at, uh, this, is, this would be better correlated with sample quality than, than the likelihood correlates with only judgment in practice. The one drawback is that you still have to have a predictive model here, right? Uh, if the classifier is not available, then, well, you could create this classifier yourself, or you could use a classifier that's trained that's train or pre-trained on a large data set, for example, in the inception network. Um, or if a classifier is not available, there's other scores that could be used, um, which is, uh, of which two that are really popular are the Frechet inception distance and the kernel inception distance. So first of all, what is Frechet inception distance? Um, this is a metric that compares the distribution. It, com it looks at the similarity between generated images and real images using, uh, using a metric called the Frechet distance but it does that not in pixel space, but in the space of activations of a pre-trained neural net. So basically two images could be very similar to each other in pixel space, but have a very large L2 distance. So if you take two images and you just shift one image by a pixel, it's visually the same image, but if you look at the L2 distance, it could be huge. Um, so instead what we could do is we can run both images through a conv net and look at the activations of one of the final layers and measure L2 distance in that. And typically two semantically similar images will have very, very, very similar activations um, because of the way the ConvNet applies these uh, kind of translation variant filters. As a result, the activations will be similar and we can, and they provide a better way of comparing images. So what the Frechet inception distance does is that it applies this Frechet divergence but not in the space of pixels, it applies it in the space of activations, right? So this is what I mean also here. When I say feature representations, that those are the activations of a, of, of a neural net. So in practice, how do we compute the FID? Let's say we have two samples, G and T, that's the generated and the real data. Um, then we compute feature representations for each of these. So we, we take each image and we go from pixel space to the space of activations of a pre-trained neural network, which again could be this pre-trained inception architecture, but 
principle, it could be something else too. In practice, this is what's used. Um, and then we can approximate this Roche distance by fitting a Gaussian to these distributions, these distributions, and then we measure the Frechet distance between Gaussians, which is effectively, um, which is given to us by this form. So this is the Frechet distance between two Gaussians, <coughs> and these are the Gaussians that we have fit to the distribution of activations. Um, so there's still an approximation factor that comes in when we fit those Gaussians, like maybe they have, maybe the distribution of activations have the same mean and the same variance, but actually there's like a third moment that's different. So that's a small nuance, but in practice, um, this still does a really good job at comparing the distribution of generated and fake images, uh, generated and real images. Um, so yeah, we essentially map images into a space of activations. We fit two Gaussians, and then we apply the Frechet shade divergence over these two Gaussians, which gives us this metric. And lower FID means better quality because the two distributions are more similar to each other. Okay, so this is the Frechet inception distance. The kernel inception distance is doing something similar, except instead of comparing the, instead of, instead of applying the Frechet distance in, uh, in activation space, it applies the MMD, the maximum mean discrepancy in, in that space. MMD is a two-sample test. Remember, we talked about two-sample tests when we looked at GANs. So the MMD is a two-sample test. It defines a statistic such that if the two distributions are different, the statistics will be higher. And if the distributions are, are, are similar, the statistics will be lower. And uh, specifically, the way that we do this is we compare. So we do the following. here. The first term compares, so, okay, the, the kernel here, the kernel here is a way of comparing to x's, x and x prime. Remember, in our previous example of kernels, if x and x prime are, are similar, then this will have a large value. If, it's, if, it's, if they're different, then we have a, it will have a low value. Um, so this measures the extent to which they're similar, and it takes the expectation over all pairs of x and x prime. So given two sample, given two points sampled at random from my first set, my first distribution P, I look at how similar are they among each other. Then I look at how similar there are within Q. And then I look at how similar is a point, one point from P, one point from Q. And I take the difference between them. And if they're the same distribution, then it shouldn't matter if I pick two points from P or two points from Q or one point from P and one point from Q, it should all be the same. Like these expectations should all be the same. But if they're not, then this will be non-zero. And therefore we will, we will, yeah, this will, they will have a non-zero statistic for two sample tests and we will be inclined to reject the hypothesis that P and Q are the same. So kernel inception distance applies this um, apply this uh, this test statistic again in the feature space of a classifier such as an inception network. So the process of applying kernel inception distance is the same as FID, but once I have my images in embedding space, I apply this formula, and if it's large, then and that's, and that's bad. Uh, so there are some advantages that, that KID has over FID. First of all, you can choose an arbitrary kernel here. Uh, so you can, you can define a notion of similarity between points in different ways. This could also be a, mi a kernel. A mixture of kernel is also a kernel. So you can, you can have a, a more sophisticated way of comparing distributions. So that's, that's nice. And, um, and also there are some interesting statistical properties. So for example, the FID, when estimated from finite samples, the FID tends to, an estimator of FID from a finite number of samples tends to be a biased estimator because the FID is always positive, it tends to overestimate it. It's an interesting fact that the KID is unbiased because it's not, this can always be positive or negative. So in practice, when you apply, when you approximate this with Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo is an unbiased estimator, therefore this 
the Monte Carlo estimator of this formula will also be unbiased. So that's nice. And uh, the disadvantage is that KAD requires more computation. So this it takes we go n squared time. So depending on how big your data set is, this might actually be a problem. Um, so typically you tend to use a large n here, like on the order of tens of thousands, uh, which means that this could in practice be, a, you wanna use like your full test set uh, and, and a set of samples of the same size. This could be on the order of tens of thousands. This could be computationally challenging. Okay, so these are some techniques. So by the way, for chain inception distance, inception scores, definitely for chain inception distance is probably the most standard metric for image quality right now. So if you take any paper on image generative models, you will almost likely have an FID number. So this is an extremely important and widely used metric. But is it like an accurate metric to judge yeah. quality? Yeah, I don't think any of these metrics is a perfectly accurate metric, but you can definitely show that this is, it will correlate better to visual sample quality than likelihood, for example. Yeah, there's definitely correlation. Definitely image samples have been getting better and FID has been getting better too. It's not like we're getting better FIDs, but our samples are getting worse. Okay, so in the time that's left, I wanna look at the last task that we have in general modeling, which is evaluating late variables, right? And as you can imagine, this is also a not well-defined task. So we want a good representation, but just as in generation or just as in other areas of general modeling, good can have different meanings, and it's unclear what good can mean. So one meaning of good is whether it's useful for downstream tasks. That, that's actually the easy scenario. For example, we might be interested in latent representations which are good for downstream tasks like semi-supervised learning. Let's say that, yeah, we want to train a generative model, and, and then we want to use that. We, want, we either want to use the latent representations on new data points for making predictions, or we will somehow find clusters in the data. And then these clusters will get labels from a few labeled points. And then we will define a classifier based on that. But essentially, generative models are naturally suited for semi supervised learning because, because missing data can be, missing labels can be treated as latent variables. And so if there's a downstream task like semi-supervised learning, then that makes things very easy. We have a well-defined metric. So there is this paper by uh, Sally Manzer all called the Proof GANs where they train again, and then they derived activations. They took, they derived latent variable representations from the pre-final layer of activations of the GAN, kind of one of the techniques that I mentioned, one of the heuristic techniques that I mentioned in the GAN lecture. Uh, and then they use that as the basis for semi-supervised learning. And that works very, very well. Um, only you, so you can get, um, you get something like, uh, like with 200, with, I think with 100 labels, you get less than 1% error rate. Uh, so it works quite well. Um, and again, if your goal is to get good latent representation for semi-supervised learning, just measure that. Or if you care about some task, measure that. The problem is that in many cases, there are no downstream tasks. So we have to figure out what a good representation means, right? So there's three possible tasks that we might be interested in. Maybe we wanna discover some kind of latent clusters in the data. Maybe we're interested in the Z itself as a latent code that compresses the data, All right? So Z is a, you can think of the encoder as a compression algorithm that creates the code and then the decoder is the decompression algorithm. Maybe we care about ML-based compression. And then there's this other quantity of this entanglement that you might be interested in. So what do I mean by clustering? I showed this figure in one of the earlier slides and it kind of shows the type of interesting structure that a general model can find. So in this case, we have a, uh, here we train a model called an adversarial autoencoder, which is an extension of a generative autoencoder uh, I will talk about an adversarial autoencoder uh, in one of the coming lectures. It's a way of combining these and GANs, but essentially it gives you these latent representations, which discover a lot of interesting structure in the data. 
Gaussian. So here we find it was trained with a prior that's a mixture of 20 Gaussians, and it has found interesting clusters that correspond to different digits. So without, this was trained on MNIST, it didn't know what a digit is, it didn't know that there are different types of digit, but it learned to put all the, all the ones together here, and all the twos are here, and furthermore, within the set of twos, it, had, it has found two subclasses which weren't even in the labels. This is how you know that it found good clusters. Um, yeah, so, 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 so clearly clustering or like unsupervised structure discovery is something that can be done using generative models. The question is, how do we evaluate it, right? Well, one way to do this is to, I guess one world is when we do have labels. In this case, we actually have labels. We have the true MNIST labels that the model did not use, but we can use for evaluation. And so there are ways of doing clustering using, uh, there are ways of evaluating clustering when we have labels. So there are several uh, quantitative evaluation metrics that we can use. In fact, they're even implemented in scikit-learn, and there are these two important scores called the completeness score and the homogeneity score that you might be interested in. When we evaluate clustering, so first of all, we have a model, it has, it has learned, it has learned this thing, so it has given us some clusters. In practice, the model can often tell us that each point belongs to a different cluster. It can, it can, tell, it can tell this. And if not, then we can apply k-means in latent space to discover, or Gaussian mixture models in latent space to discover those clusters, right? So let's say that we have found interesting clusters either from the model directly or by using k-means on top of the latent representations of the model. And now we're interested in evaluating these clusters and we have access to labels. So when given clusters and we, when we want to evaluate them, we have this trade-off that's similar to having false positives and false negatives, right? Like one approach is we could put all, we could have a single big cluster that contains all of the data points. All of the data goes into one cluster. Imagine that we did this. In some sense, it's good because the same class never gets spread out between two different clusters. That's great, uh, but the problem is that is that you know we we put all the points together, or we could also have a separate point for each, a separate cluster for each point. Then we're in the other extreme. Our clusters are maximally pure, but they're not um, that useful because we have too many of them. They're they're too small, and a class is spread out across many points. So these two trade offs, you can they're they're somehow comparable to having false positives and false negatives, in my head at least, uh, but you can think of also them as being like purity and completeness. Uh, so this is what's captured by these two metrics. So completeness is basically maximized when all of the data points that are that have the same label, they get put within the same cluster, right? So I want all of the ones to be together. I don't want all my ones to be spread out across 10 different clusters. Um, so this was the first example that I alluded to. It had high completeness, but it had low, um, it had low homogeneity. So homogeneity can be thought of a measure of pureness. So we basically want, in an ideal world, we have ten classes and we have ten clusters and we have a one-to-one -one mapping. But in practice, it doesn't happen. Certain classes might be spread across different clusters. Then that will have a lower completeness score, uh, or a certain a cluster might have multiple classes inside of it. It's also worse. It means that our clusters are impure. They don't have perfect homogeneity, so that's a problem that we might have. And so combining homogeneity and completeness into a single score by taking their harmonic mean gives us the V-measure score. Um, so similarly to how we can have a harmonic mean of like precision and recall. Yeah, maybe precision and recall is actually a better way of thinking uh, about this. It's kind of like precision and recall. Uh, we can have more completeness or we can have more homogeneity. And when we take the harmonic mean, it kind of corresponds to the F1 score. Okay, so uh, this is what we can do if we have labels, if not, I don't know, manual inspection maybe is the next best thing to do. Uh, we can also look at other properties of latent scores, for example, compression. So there's a lot of work on using general models for image compress for data compression in general. This is an example from image compression. Uh, 
So here, this is a data set of shoes. And here we have some baselines of JPEG compression. Um, and then these uh, folks created an algorithm called ENCODE. And you can see that, so this is the clean image. JPEG 2000 at least gives a very blurry image and it gets like 21X compression. And then these models, which do reconstruction, they find they can reconstruct a very high quality image. And so that just means that we also have high compression. We can measure the compression level of these, uh, of a general model, just as we measure the compression of a, of a um, regular compression algorithm, um, bits per pixel. It's closely related to likelihood. Um, yeah, we can, we can measure this and it gives us this, uh, uh, yeah, we can measure it and it gives us a quantitative metric for how good the generative model is, and it can be a measure of the latent space quality. So this is an interesting downstream task. And then the last topic I want to mention is disentanglement. So disentanglement is, there's a literature on studying disentanglement. A lot of uh, researchers are interested in this. It's the idea that you want to find latent presentations, which automatically learn to discover factors of variations, which we as human, which we as humans would find intuitive. So specifically, let's say that we have a data set of faces. It would be great if, so we know that um, when, when, we were, when we look at a data set of human faces, we as humans can perceive there to be natural factors of variation. For example, skin color or hair color or age or gender, there's natural factors of variation, which we as humans perceive to be important. It would be great if the model would discover these automatically and so, for example, once we have learned the general model, we look at one component of the vector Z, and it happens to correspond to age. We look at another one that corresponds to color. And, and when we change color, it doesn't change age. When we change skin color, it doesn't change age. When we change age, it doesn't change skin color or hair color or anything like this. So it learns to find natural factors of variation, and these factors of variation are disentangled. If we change one, it doesn't change the other. It's a nice property that we might want to have. And so here, this is an example of, yeah, so well, actually here, here, here's an example of how it might look like on a toy data set. This is a data set of shapes. And this is a, um, so in this case, if we could have one dimension that corresponds to the size, and then another dimension that corresponds to the shape, and they're completely dis disentangled, changing one doesn't change the other. Yeah, this is, this is an example of disentanglement in a simpler example. This is something that people care about and that you might be interested in. Um, and there's many techniques for enforcing these methods. Um, I briefly mentioned InfoVE, I think, in one of the, one of the lectures. Um, but essentially, there are all sorts of techniques that involve regularizing uh, the latent space of diffusion models using techniques such as the mutual information term. Um, and in practice, for example, InfoGAN, when applied to a data set of faces, it can produce images which, so here in this example, they had, uh, they train a GAN with two sets of latent variables. One is the regular noise, and then there was also an additional low dimensional auxiliary latent variable. And when they regularized the model with the mutual information term to encourage the use of that latent variable, in this InfoGAN paper, they found that that latent variable would correspond to interesting factors of variation. For example, within that, I don't know if, I don't remember if they use like four or 10 or eight dimensional uh, latent variable, but one dimension correspond to the position of the face, another one correspond to lighting. So it, it, in some cases on some data sets, again, this is kind of hard, but still sometimes we're able to discover interesting factors of variation. And there are some quantitative metrics, which I will just name here. <clears throat> I'm not going to define them in detail, but if you're interested in this, you should look up papers such as beta VE, where they define their own metric. There's a factor VE metric, uh, and there's some additional uh, scores that exist that you should look at if you're interested in this topic. Okay, so that's it for, 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 for the lecture. I'll just conclude by again summarizing that. Quantitative evaluation is challenging. We have downstream tasks. That's the best thing we can do. But otherwise, there are specialized, specialized metrics 
that we can use depending on whether we're interested in density estimation or sampling or late representations.